Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is David Logsdon. I'm the Executive Director of the Tech America Space Enterprise Council. On behalf of the Council and the George Marshall Institute, I welcome you to today's forum. Now, back in the heady days of the uh, vision for space exploration, uh, Space Enterprise Council did a series of studies for NASA uh, focusing on the moon as a destination, and we were are, were and clearly still are very bullish on the moon as uh, the near-term destination, with Mars being the ultimate net destination. And those two studies focused on uh, standards and risk assessment. Uh, those studies brought in not just aerospace companies, two of which are here today, Aerojet and Boeing, but also, and most importantly, uh, some of the companies from the business verticals, which are going to be, which are going to be and are uh, critically important to um, where we take exploration. Um, it can't just be a aerospace venture, it needs to be an international venture, but most importantly, uh, it needs to bring in uh, business verticals, the commercial aspect. So in that respect, we still are very bullish on the moon as the near-term ultimate destination. So with those opening comments, I'm going to hand it over to the president of the George Marshall Institute, Mr. Jeff Keeter. Thank you, David, and thank you all for being with us today as we enter in this series of discussions uh, that the Space Enterprise Council and the Marshall Institute will be hosting uh, beginning today, uh, another session on the 17th of April, where we talk about human exploitation of various celestial bodies. And today's is focused on the moon and to a lesser extent Mars, uh, but the, the next session will focus on asteroids uh, and what we might do uh, if we were to ever catch an asteroid. And, and really that is the main and principal focus of this series, uh, is to discuss what we can expect to find if we are to land on one of these bodies and then what we can do once we get there, both technically uh, as well as the rationale for doing it. What can we expect to find uh, in these various areas? What can we do uh, once we're there and what kinds of return on our investments uh, can we expect to see? Uh, and so I'm very pleased to have these three panelists here with us today to begin to explore uh, that, that particular set of questions. And really the series builds off of a project that the Marshall Institute uh, uh, prepared over the course of 2013, a book that some of you may have picked up some information on, uh, America's Space Futures. And the idea behind that project uh, was to define, help to define the architecture for the rationale for space exploration, for human exploration uh, in particular. And, and so this series of uh, events that we're sponsoring, the human settlement of space, is a continuation of that theme. And so I'm pleased to introduce the three, the three panelists that we have with us today. Dr. Paul Spudis will kick off the panel. Uh, he is an expert on planetary geology and remote sensing at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. He'll be followed by Dr. Chaim Benaroya, a distinguished professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at Rutgers University. And then finally, the panel will close with a presentation from Mike Gold, the director of Washington, D.C. operations and business growth for Bigelow Aerospace. At LLC. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Dr. Spoonies. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming out on this snowy day. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we found about the moon recently. And we've made some rather interesting discoveries, in large part because of uh, a series of missions that uh, undertaken by a variety of countries for a variety of different motivations that all contribute to our uh, understanding of and appreciation of the value of the moon and the potential for its habitation. So let me start off with the big picture. Why do we care about the moon? Why is the moon important? I think the moon's important for three reasons. It's close, it's interesting, and it's useful. By close, I mean it's accessible. You can always reach the moon. There's always a launch window to it. Under normal trajectories, it's only three to four days away. By space flight, you can take slow boat trajectories for big cargo missions. But yet, if you got into trouble on a human mission, it was very easy to abort and return home. So the accessibility of the moon is, it means it's easy to reach in human terms. More importantly, it means that you can remotely control robotic operations on the moon in real time, something you cannot do on Mars or asteroids or any other extraterrestrial body. So on the moon, we can place robots to do work and actually have them respond in real time for real time control. It's interesting because the moon 
uh, is an object that retains not only its own history, its own planetary history, which is an interesting story in itself, but because it orbits the Earth, it also contains the early history of the Earth. So the moon is a recorder of the Earth-moon history, and in addition, because it has no atmosphere and global magnetic field, it records the output of the sun and the galaxy through time. So we can read that particle and, and, and molecular record that's recorded in the lunar dust. And finally, and I think this is the most important reason why we care about the moon, is it's useful. It is an enabling asset for space exploration because it has the material and energy resources we need to create new spacefaring capability. So what is, first of all, let's give you some basic facts about the moon. I, I, I tried to kind of prepare this for people with a variety of backgrounds so that we're all on the same page. The moon is a small object. Uh, it's only 3,800 kilometers in diameter. It has one-sixth the gravity of the Earth. It has no atmosphere. It has a uh, hard radiation surface environment, all galactic cosmic rays, solar particle events, uh, solar wind fluence is all impacts onto the surface, and that has some interesting consequences. The moon has no global magnetic field, so none of these particles are deflected by the magnetic field, and all these things occur at, at varying degrees, varying depending on latitude, of course. At the equator, you get the maximum fluence of solar particles. At the poles, you get a much lower fluence because you're going in at an angle. Um, it's a fairly ordinary object. It's made up of the common elements that we find on the Earth, aluminum, iron, silicon, and oxygen. In fact, oxygen is an interesting one because that's uh, the moon 45% by weight is oxygen, so it turns out that that's a useful uh, property. Uh, it has a very slow rotation rate. So at the equator, you have 14 days of daylight and 14 days of nighttime, which results because of the no atmosphere and temperature extremes. At high noon on the moon, it's 100 centigrade, and at uh, the, early, the coldest parts of the morning, just before dawn, it gets down to minus 150. That's a 100, uh, 250 degree temperature swing. The polar areas are different, and I'll talk about those a little in a little bit. So the question about settlement is, uh, what do people need? What would, what would you actually need if you wanted to live on the moon? Well, you need air to breathe and pressurized volume. You can't exist in a vacuum or a low pressure environment. You need to have uh, air to breathe and you need pressure to, to uh, keep your fluids uh, uh, liquid. Uh, you need water, both for drinking and for a variety of uh, uh, food preparation, for washing. Um, you need food, and for food is primarily a series of compounds made from the light elements, things like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, the, the, the famous Chan series. Now you would think that the moon is fairly barren in those, but in actual fact, the moon does have reservoirs of them, and they occur in many places, uh, some of which are accessible. You need to protect yourself from the environment. You obviously can't stand to be exposed to the hard radiation environment or the vacuum, so you need to protect yourself. And that is actually achievable through fairly simple means. Uh, in the case of uh, protecting yourself from radiation, you can jacket your habitat in water. You can bury it with regolith. There's a variety of different ways to protect uh, that, which also happens to have the added benefit of giving you an equitable thermal control. Uh, and finally, you have can we deal with this gravity? Can we deal with the low gravity? Is that an issue for long-term human health? We know that on inter, uh, the ISS experience that microgravity is detrimental to human physiology, so we need to take countermeasures. That may be necessary on the moon. We just don't know that yet. So what are the resources of the moon? And they come in sort of two categories. There's materials and energy. Uh, first, you can consider the soil of the moon, which is the ground-up surface layer. It's, 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 it's created by the bombardment of the moon by micrometeorites. Uh, it's, is, as soil is actually useful as a bulk product. You can use it for shielding. You can create things with it. You can uh, um, uh, use, it as, uh, use it to make building aggregate, which is something that uh, people have looked at. And you can, in fact, uh, sinter it to make uh, ceramics and bricks. So it has a variety of uses in itself. If you wanted to process it more than that, you can smelt it for its metals. Typical lunar soil contains aluminum, iron, uh, titanium in some cases. All of that is retrievable. Uh, metal mining is a fairly high energy process because you have to break those metal oxygen bonds. It requires a lot of energy input. So I think that will be something more for an advanced base. Uh, the light elements, as I mentioned before, are rare, although they do occur in the lunar dust. In the typical lunar dust returned by Apollo, we have anywhere from 40 to about 100 parts per million hydrogen. 
Where does that come from? That hydrogen comes from the solar wind, which is physically implanted on the dust grains. Interestingly enough, when they first took soil from the moon and heated it up at about 700 degrees, they got water vapor, even though there's no hydrous mineral phases and there's no water at all in the lunar samples. What was happening? Well, it turned out when you heated the soil, that solar wind hydrogen was released and mobilized, and that reduced the metal oxides in the soil to native metal and oxygen. The oxygen then combined with the released hydrogen and it made water vapor. So in fact, just roasting the soil in place will make water vapor. And how much depends on how much heat and how rich the ore uh, deposit is. But fortunately, we found that there are more and better sources of hydrogen near the poles of the moon. I'll talk about energy only in the following sense. The poles are interesting because we have found places where the sun shines for more than half the day. And there's a very interesting reason for that. It turns out that enables you to get a foothold on the moon with a lot less effort than you might think. Now, I'm not going to talk in detail about this. These are the kinds of things you would be doing in terms of building and creating structures on the moon. The next speaker will go into this in some detail. But I do want to point out one very interesting development. And that is, although we know quite a bit about the moon and we know what it's made of and how to uh, process those materials into useful things, there's a major revolution, I think, coming in terms of building lunar structures and a lunar base uh, through the advent of 3D printing. Effectively, it takes information and digitally recreates material objects in whatever form you want. The materials we need, the raw feedstock for 3D printing, can be found on the moon. We've had a lot of missions to the moon in the last 10 years. And as I made this, looked over this slide this morning, I realized I left off two. There have been two more American missions to the moon since this slide was made. There has been a GRAIL, which was a gravity mapping mission a couple years ago, and the current mission, LADEE, which is looking at the lunar exosphere and the dust uh, properties of the moon. But in effect, these missions, starting with the Smart One technology demo back in, in the early 2000s, all the way up to the currently orbiting and sending data lunar reconnaissance orbiter have totally changed our picture of the moon and the way it works. So I mentioned earlier the polar environment. What's, what's the value of the poles? It comes, stems from a very simple property, simple geometric property. The spin axis of the moon is perpendicular to the ecliptic plane. The inclination is a degree and a half. Now on Earth, the inclination is 23 and a half degrees. So as the Earth orbits the sun, for six months, the North Pole is pointing at the sun, so it's, it's summertime in the Northern Hemisphere. In the opposite six months, it's pointing away from the sun, and it's wintertime in the Northern Hemisphere. In the other hemisphere, the seasons are reversed. But because the moon's spin axis is perpendicular to the ecliptic, the sun is always on the horizon at the poles. Now, what this means is, is that standing at the pole during the course of a lunar day, which is 708 hours to rotate once on its axis, I would see the, moon, see the sun on the horizon slowly moving around me around the entire 360 degrees of the horizon. Sometimes it would be above the horizon, sometimes it would be below. The angular width of the sun is about a half a degree, so the inclination is a degree and a half, so it's going to go up and down above the horizon. Now that's if the moon was a perfectly smooth sphere, but of course we know that it isn't. There are holes, which means it's going to be dark, and there are peaks, which means those are going to get more sunlight than you'd think. So the question then becomes, what does that mean in terms of the environment of the poles? turns out to have very profound consequences because that geometrical arrangement of topography results in the fact that some places on the moon are extremely cold. And in fact, we didn't know until lunar reconnaissance orbiter exactly how cold they were. That coldness has some very interesting consequences. So let's look at the lighting maps. These are two lighting maps produced by LROC, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera, which basically took a picture of the pole each time it passed over the moon over the course of an entire year. And those pictures were summed up and added together to produce this map. Now on these images, black means areas that never see the sun, and white are areas that see the sun a significant amount of time. And in fact, we can calculate from these images exactly what parts of the moon have high degrees of illumination and what parts are never illuminated. The dark areas are permanently dark here in black. The brightest areas we found, there's no area that's in permanent sunlight, but there are areas that are in sunlight for greater than 95% of the entire year. Extended periods of sunlight, proximate to deep uh, permanent darkness and, and, and extreme cold, is an extremely valuable place to put a lunar habitat. Why? Because the big tall pole in the tent for lunar habitation has been surviving this 14-day nighttime, which gets very cold and has a long time to live on batteries. By putting this outpost at the poles in these lit areas, 
not only do you have constant solar illumination to generate electricity, it's also thermally benign because the incidence of the sun angle is always a few degrees, which means the surface never gets much hotter than about minus 50 centigrade. Now, the, in terms of temperature, this map, these two maps show the temperature, the residual maximum temperature of every point at the lunar poles, both north and south. Uh, north is on the left, south is on the right. And I pay particular attention to colors that are greenish and cooler, green, blue, and violet. Those are the areas that are colder than 104 Kelvin, which is uh, just 100, it's minus uh, one, uh, uh, 173 about centigrade. Now those areas are areas where water is, is stable on the lunar surface. Any place that's, that's colder than 104 Kelvin, water will be there forever. So these are called cold traps. So it means if any water molecules get into a cold trap, they can't get out again. There's no known process to physically dislodge them. So in effect, these can accumulate uh, water over extended periods of time and that may seem like a very slow process, and it is, but remember, we have billions of years. So you've got a process adding water molecule by molecule over billions of years. Over time, that adds up to a substantial amount. Now, my, uh, in particular, the research I've been doing, I have two experiments. One I had on the Indian Chandrayaan-1 mission, and then I have an, an additional one on the current LRO mission, is an imaging radar. Now, unlike cameras and other uh, uh, sensors that basically sense the passive radiation of the moon, we, act, we are active sensors. We illuminate the dark areas into the poles and we analyze the backscatter reflections. And so what we're looking for is a, diff is a signature in the diffuse backscatter that indicates a compositional difference. Now, the way this works in radar is, typically, uh, radar will send out a polarized signal. If you get an inverse polarized signal in reception, that, that's, a, that's called a simple specular reflection. It's like off of a mirror. But in addition to the specular reflections, you get diffuse reflections. Now, typically on the moon, you get the opposite sense from what you transmitted. You may transmit right circular polarized, you get left circular polarized back. However, two kinds of targets have a different diffuse signature. One are rocky areas. If you have something that's very rocky, then you might have areas where you have a lot of, of, of debris where the radio, radio waves bounce twice. So I come in this way at right circular polarized, I bounce off a rock facet, I go over here, I bounce back to the original sense, so I'm getting same sense back. That can generate high CPR. The other thing that can generate high circular polarization ratio is the presence of ice. And the reason that happens is two effects. One, ice is transparent to radio, so you get deep penetration and multiple scattering, just like you would with a rocky field. But in addition to that, when you're looking at zero phase, you get an interferometric enhancement called the coherent backscatter. So what we've tried to do in this radar is look for the coherent backscatter signature. Now I call your attention to this slide here. There's an optical image on the top and a radar image on the bottom. And basically the yellow and the reddish colors on the bottom are indicative of high circular polarization ratio. This is the diffuse backscatter signal. Notice that all of these craters have dark interiors. They don't see the sunlight, so they're near the pole. This is near the crater Perry, near the North Pole. But the linings of the craters are all highly reflective in diffuse backscatter with high CPR. These areas are very cold, they're very dark, water is stable here. I think what we're looking at is the signature of water ice in these polar craters. And in fact, the, the graph shows this. The graph shows the, the green and the red plots. Green is the CPR outside the crater, red is the CPR inside the crater. And you see there's a definite difference. Typically with a fresh crater, you see this, and that's caused by rockiness, you see the signature inside and outside the crater. With these anomalous ones, we only see it inside the crater. So if, I, if this really is ice, what do, how much are we talking about? Is this a minuscule amount? To get this coherent backscatter effect, you need ice to be on the order of tens of wavelengths thick. Now the wavelength we're, tra we're transmitting in is, is S-band. It's 12 and a half centimeters. So we're talking about ice that's on the order of one to two to three meters thick on that order. So what I did here was I just mapped all these anomalous craters into the pole and calculated the area multiplied it times two meters thick, and I get about 600 million cubic meters. If it's ice, that's 600 million metric tons. Now, to get, put this in perspective, if some people say, well, there's not enough to live on the moon, that is, that, just that amount of water is enough water to launch from the moon the equivalent of a space shuttle, which is about 735 metric tons of water equivalent, every day for 2,200 years. All right, 
So suppose I'm wrong, suppose I've got this off. Even if I'm off by, fit by 100%, it's still a thousand years to launch a shuttle every day. And that's a lot of water. So it certainly is enough to create a sustainable human presence on the moon. So what's the value of this? Well, what, have I, what we found from these missions, the data provided from these missions, is not only is there a place where we can stay, because it's thermally benign and we can generate electrical power, there's a place that has the materials we need. In addition to the ice that's there, all, uh, what Elcross found during the impact of this uh, upper stage of the centaur is that there are other light elements, like nitrogen, like uh, uh, carbon, a variety of simple organic compounds. All of these things occur in the polar dark traps. The reason that we have these organic compounds is because we think this ice mostly comes from cometary impacts. So ultimately, these materials are found in the nuclei of comets that have bombarded the moon over time. Water is the most useful substance you can find in space. Think about it. You can support human life with it. So you can, you can shield your habitat. You can crack it in the hydrogen and oxygen and breathe the oxygen. You can use hydrogen and oxygen as reagents in a fuel cell, reversible fuel cell. So during the sunlight, you can crack the water into its component gases. And during the nighttime or eclipse, you can recombine them in the fuel cell to generate electricity. So it's a medium of energy storage. And finally, and most importantly, it is the most powerful chemical rocket propellant we know of. So liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen are basically what the shuttle main engine uses. And now we know that we can refuel with that on the moon. So what does that mean? I think the means that the moon is the most important object that we can go to. And we go to the moon not to repeat Apollo and not to do a PR stunt, but rather to make space permanent, make, space per make, make our presence there permanent for whatever purposes we want. It's not just a matter of going there to live to do it. It's a matter of using what the moon has to offer to create true spacefaring capability. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks. It's great to be here. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to follow Paul. I, I'm an admirer of, of his writings and, uh, and his push to make uh, a return to the moon something that uh, we go back to. Uh, it's something that I've been pushing for a long time, um, probably half my career, or half my life, I should say. And unfortunately, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't last long it, as far as uh, policy goes. So what I want to talk about is really um, the, the structural engineer's perspective. Uh, to go to the moon, to create an, uh, a habitat where humans can live and survive uh, as, a, as a basis for future exploration, uh, not as a, as a one shot. So just a few interesting slides. This is a, a picture from a Russian newspaper on, on, uh, uh, called Evening Moscow, where uh, they uh, celebrate Yuri Gagarin's uh, trip into space. Here's from uh, Florida today. Uh, on top, the, um, the first Apollo astronauts on the moon, and at the bottom, uh, President Nixon at the time speaking to them, uh, congratulating them, and some uh, early concepts. So, so one of the things that may not be uh, as well known as it should be is that while Apollo was going on, um, people were actually designing and thinking what the next steps would be. So Apollo, for a large portion of the community, was not seen as going there and stopping, and that was it. It was really as a first step, and part of that first step would be to uh, design structures, and um, the Army Corps of Engineers had a 1963 manual this thick on a research center for the lunar surface. So a lot of stuff was going on, and basically was cut short when, when we stopped doing that. Here's some early Boeing concepts. Um, this is a, basically you'll see a lot of these concepts are soup can kind, kind of structures because they're the strongest uh, structures for being internally pressurized, which they would have to be for human habitation. Uh, this is uh, showing you um, a concept for six people for a six-month stay on the lunar surface. You can see the people on the bottom right uh, for size. Uh, the other thing you can see is the, the shielding, which is required for any surface structure. You can see on the top and also at the insert, perhaps, uh, how uh, a regolith will be vacuumed from the lunar surface on top of the structure. Uh, and, uh, and, and even though this concept doesn't show it, you really would have to shield from all sides uh, to shield against the radiation and micrometeorite uh, impacts. So here's a, a whole list of things that one would have to really deal with as far as um, designing a structure on the moon. So as a structural engineer, you know, structures are important, but uh, human survivability is more important. And certainly a lot of the issues that um, are, are unresolved as far as humans, humans living on the moon is how will they survive. So uh, Paul mentioned about the, the fact is, can humans survive in a 1-6 G environment? And that's an open question. 
some medical doctors who are much more knowledgeable than I am on this issue say that anything off of 1G is not survivable without intervention, gene therapy, other kinds of, of, uh, of things. So, you know, human uh, psychology, physiology, plant physiology, all these things are really issues that are as yet unresolvable uh, and not really resolvable very easily unless we actually go there and start doing testing. So uh, then there's all kinds of thermal issue, uh, thermal um, structural issues, power systems, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, in more detail. And at the bottom, and again, this is not meant to diminish the importance, it's just the economics of it. Clearly, the economics is, is critical. It's, it's the thing that's stopping us from doing it as much as uh, medical science is stopping us from doing it. So uh, it, it all, it all uh, is part of the larger picture. So the lunar environment, uh, from an engineering point of view, 1.6 G, we have to pressurize, internally pressurize the structures so that humans can live in there, anywhere from 10 to 15 PSI would be acceptable. Uh, protect against radiation and micrometeorites uh, from the environment. Uh, insulate against temperature differentials on the order of 250 degrees Celsius. Um, and many of the surface structure concepts use regolith as the shielding agent, somewhere around 10 feet of regolith. Um, other environmental factors, the regolith dust we found from, from uh, the Apollo era is extremely uh, carcinogenic and also it's microscopic with very sharp edges, like a, like a micro razor blade. Uh, it, it worked its way into the astronaut suits, it worked its way into machinery, uh, it was not predicted uh, before the Apollo, first, uh, Apollo astronauts first walked on the moon, and it had to be dealt with uh, in, in maintaining machinery. Um, I put here moonquakes. Uh, we did a recent study on it. It's not a critical issue as far as structural dynamics, uh, but it's there. Um, we, we, we observed um, um, magnitudes of on the order of 5 Richter, uh, and the difference between moonquakes and earthquakes is that the moonquakes last a lot longer and may have certain kinds of effects, maybe not on a structure, but maybe on some more fragile kinds of electronics or components. Uh, and then again, the human physiology. So uh, energy production is one, one, re one reason that people have put forward to go to the moon. Uh, there have been a lot of interesting ideas. I think one of the most interesting was put forward by Shimizu, where they would um, wrap a belt around the moon of a sizable width of solar panels. And those solar panels would then gather energy Project it back to Earth. It's a very nice, very nice image. Um, mining for all kinds of materials uh, is another another example. Um, I would say that probably uh, the resources that are on the Moon are most valuable for for use on the Moon uh, for first settlements. Tourism, uh, tourism is, has been put forward for many years as a driving uh, for economic force for um, going back to the Moon and various orbits. Uh, this is a nice image drawn by um, uh, Peter Enstan, uh, a London-based architect uh, under a commission from Hilton, I think around 1990, for a lunar surface Hilton. So Hilton actually wrote a paper, I think it was in 67, talking about hotels on, on the moon. Uh, so, so Hilton has thought about this for a long time, and you can see how, how this looks. I might, not, I might not have put that huge meteorite heading toward, <laughs> heading toward New York, but that's just me, you know? Uh, it's exciting enough to be on the moon without being under a meteorite attacking you, so that's fine. Uh, this concept for uh, a hotel did not work, so, Mar so Marriott went to version two. Hopefully nobody's here from Marriott. Um, so this is a more lunar surface Marriott. Basically, again, shell types of structures uh, can resist the, the internal pressurization. You can see some, some people floating around there and enjoying themselves. This is a... Um, microgravity swimming pool. So if you put a fluid in, in lower or very low gravity, it basically wants to become its, a sphere due to surface tension. So this is a swimming pool where there's no buoyancy. So if you swim down, if you jump into it, buoyancy is not going to push you out. So you got to swim out of that. So you can see this is just a nice, nice illustration of some different things that will happen if you try to go to some of these bodies. Here's a, um, a lunar surface, a stadium very, very high. You see people jumping 30, 40 feet without a problem. There was, I read a paper where there was an NFL football uh, player who went and uh, uh, briefed NASA on sports on the moon. And one of the things he, he suggested was, obviously, at 1.6 gravity, a lot of things become a lot 
different and the scale changes quite a bit. So he said, not only will you be able to throw the football much easier, but you can also pick up your mate, your, your teammate, and throw, throw him through the, the, the goal as well because of the low gravity. So a lot of different things that you done. So this is, these are some images by Carter Emmett, who's at the Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, and a space artist as well. And I believe these are Mars, although you can't really tell. But he uh, had some concepts for what surface structures might look like on the moon. This is a fairly well-developed uh, facility with solar panels and all kinds of structures. Here's another one where solar panels are, are used to line a crater to create an energy uh, receptacle. Uh, again, so, so I think this is Mars, but similar ideas could be used on the moon. Here's another one showing pressurized um, habitats. In the back there are greenhouses, which you can see a little bit better in the next drawing. So this is from inside the greenhouse. So you can see there's, a, there's a, an envelope which is basically clear, or more or less clear, for light to come in. Uh, the, the person working inside is without a spacesuit. There's a person outside with a spacesuit, and they're growing plants which will be part of any facility. Here's a very nice illustration by Gary Kittmacher from NASA. It's a very large inflatable kind of structure that's rigidized. So one of the concepts for a surface structure is to have it folded so you can actually just bring it there and then inflate it, then make it rigid for permanent habitat. So this is an advanced concept like that. Look, if you can see it closer, I'm not sure how well you can see it. It's basically, I think, five or six stories. And the people sleep at the bottom because that's the most shielded area. Then further up above them is uh, uh, a plant, plant um, areas where plants are grown, and up and further up are uh, electronics and other facilities. So this is also an inflatable concept. It's like a toroidal structure. The concept was by uh, some people from uh, TV Lynn en engineers. This is from the mid '80s. Uh, basically, you have, you unfold it, and then the toroidal structure inflates, and then the larger dome inflates. And they actually filed a patent for it. And hopefully, I guess they're, they're still waiting to be called. Here's a nice concept, basically, where an, um, a crater is cleared out, and, and cables are suspended around it, and then it would be covered and pressurized. The whole volume of, of this crater could be someplace where you can, uh, if not put people, at least put facilities that uh, require a large volume. Some of these uh, coming slides talk about um, Russian concepts. Actually, I think. Um, some of these are maybe Soviet concepts. Uh, for very large uh, facilities on the moon, uh, they call it 2050, but probably this is 2150 really is more accurate. But basically, very large structures. Uh, you can see a little bit here. A, a top view, where we've translated some of, the, some of the Russian. You can see basically a whole city yeah, uh, on the lunar surface uh, for hundreds of people. Um, also, the. Uh, many people think that the surface structures really will not be the final form of habitation on the moon or, or even on Mars, that uh, subterranean structures will most likely be the, the dominant uh, mode uh, because of the issues of radiation uh, in particular. Um, and so you can see here where uh, in this Russian concept a large area has been excavated, that's in the light gray, uh, and then the, the, whole, the whole city has been built, and then it's all covered up except for very small amounts of uh, structure. Here's one in a lava tube. So lava tubes uh, have been found on the moon, um, perhaps not as large as this one. Uh, I'm not sure. But um, the idea is that lava tubes exist from uh, earlier um, activity, uh, seismic, not uh, volcanic activity. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But, uh, and so the idea is to build in those uh, and basically have a place where you, you rigidize the lava tube and you, you have structures down there that are shielded against all the bad stuff that's on the surface. So uh, one of the problems, obviously, and we learned a lot of this, regarding, especially regarding the space station, but even from Apollo era, is it's very difficult to construct in space. The astronauts get overheated. They get exhausted. The astronauts cannot be our constru construction crew. So, so unless we can do it robotically in some way, it's, very, uh, it's hard to conceive of how we can build large cities on the moon or Mars or uh, the space station took a very long time because it's just extremely complicated to do that. Uh, and so there are issues of radiation. Um, and um, here is a, uh, uh, an image uh, of a pie chart showing the various elements on the moon. Uh, and you can see that, uh, as was said earlier, oxygen is, is a very important part of that. But there's a lot of other elements that we need for an industrial society existing on the moon. 
And so one of the ideas is to use in situ resource utilization, ISRU, which has been a, a major uh, thrust by of many people, uh, in particular NASA, to try to see whether the resources are already there or almost all already there, that we can then send automated systems to begin construction on the, on the lunar surface so that the structures or most of the structures are already there before astronauts even get there. So this is a, an example uh, from NASA where you can see it's an automated system that is building an igloo kind of structure on the lunar surface, primarily from local regolith resources that have been processed. So we did uh, uh, some research over the past, uh, I guess, 20 years. Just looking at structural analysis, we, we picked a prototypical structure this, like this igloo. It's basically uh, two tied metal arches with a base. And so, so this uh, half circle, this semicircle is, is uh, the, the cross section and it should be internally pressurized. And what we did is we basically designed it using standard earth-based design techniques to see whether we could get something that would work. So here's a cross section. Um, it's five, five meters high. Um, has um, internal pressurization. You can see the arrows pointing out. It has the regolith shielding on top, so that's the, the dead load on the structure. It turns out that the, the design load, the, the design that we have to worry, the, the load we have to worry about is the internal pressurization. So even though we have a lot of regolith on top that sort of counters that pressurization, the internal pressure is really the, the, the consideration for the design. And then we have the, uh, the foundation in blue at the bottom. And so these are some um, computational models showing deformations and stresses, um, thermal analysis. So we, I know it's hard to see, but I, I believe these will be uh, put on, on the Marshall website. So you can see that obviously the red is uh, hotter, the blue is colder. And so we can see, depending on where the sun is located, uh, just the, the, the flow of thermal energy through the structure. So all these things are designable. There's nothing that's, that's there from the engineering point of view that we say, well, we just can't design a structure for this environment. So we did that. So here's a vibration analysis. Just showing how the structure will vibrate due to a particular kind of loading. And some seismic analysis. So seismic, we were curious about. There's been a lot, a lot written on seismic. And quite frankly, a lot of it is very difficult to follow and very cryptic. And the, the data just isn't there to to fully characterize this, the lunar surface. But from what we know, uh, it can have an impact on certain kinds of structures, but not this one. So this is a, just a vibration analysis again. And you know, whenever you internally pressurize a structure, the biggest concern is the air is going to leak. Right? You always think air is always going to leak. So how do you join something on the lunar surface and make sure that, that it doesn't do that? So this is a concept that, that, that we um, conceived of a number of years ago as part of our igloo kind of structure. And just some, just a, an end plate analysis just showing that, you know, all the tools that we have on Earth really can handle the, the, the structural problems. And when you design something, you have to also design for construction. So that igloo then will have to be designed and, and built in stages. So one of the things that perhaps is not really thought about much, uh, unless you're a structural engineer, is that you have to design something that will, will stand and support its own weight as it's being constructed. Right? It can't work only at the end. It has to work at every stage of the construction. So here we have the, the, the base of the structure. We have temporary scaffolding. We put the first arch in, and the second arch will go in, and it will all be coupled. So you have the, the, the structural framework, which then would be capped and then internally pressurized and sealed. So this is a, we, had a, uh, we had a symposium at Rutgers a number of years ago, and we had a, uh, an artist from the Star Ledger who came down and so, so he put some, some meat on the bones of our structure. So he shows the shielding on top. Uh, the nice thing about the igloo kind of structure is you can, it's modular. So you can make almost any configuration you want. You can connect them to what, what your needs are. So this is a, a nice, just to conclude, this is a nice uh, ad from Century 21, the Realtors. This, I think this was 2002. I don't remember exactly. So, so they were obviously promoting Century 21. And I can't read it on this picture here. So I have to go here and read it. So, um, brand new residential subdivision, just 238,000 miles from Earth, features big bang design by a world renowned architect. Could commute on a shuttle, no longer. Uh, full and half crater lots available. Uh, inquired at Cape Canaveral sales office. So, obviously, very futuristic thinking. It's really great, and uh, maybe that will happen one day, but it's just uh, a nice. 
a nice start. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, and thank you so much uh, for having me here today. We really appreciate the Marshall Institute tackling the topic of the moon, which we see is the next logical location for both public and private activities to focus on. And quite frankly, I'd like to go to the moon this time since it just snows less than it does in Washington, D.C. these days. So, uh, What I'm going to tell you a little bit about here is uh, Bigelow Aerospace and the technology that we're developing that could protect and sustain a presence on the moon, and then get into the legal environment that we need to protect and sustain the investments that would make such developments possible. Uh, Going to go very quickly, a lot to get through here, so let me apologize for that. Bigel Aerospace is developing expandable habitat technology. I'll go through some more of the details later on, but let me just quickly say that this technology provides greater volumes than traditional rigidized structures, enhanced protection from radiation, enhanced protection from physical debris, and protects you from the greatest threat that space projects face, budget cuts. Much worse than asteroids or radiation. Uh, we can implement these systems for roughly 10% of the price of a traditional habitat. Uh, however, while the idea was conceived of by NASA, it never really got much past the PowerPoint stage, so we had to really begin from square one at Bigelow Aerospace. And we began with the launch of a series of subscale demonstrator modules to prove and validate the technology. We hired a Russian slash Ukrainian company, ISC Cosmotros, to launch our spacecraft. They were taking the SS-18, designated Satan by NATO, the old backbone of the Soviet nuclear arsenal, removing the warhead, putting on a commercial fairing, and using these rockets for commercial space launch. Literally a swords into plowshares story. And since it was a nuclear missile, it had been built already, the price was right. You just had to take off the warhead, and we were good to go. What I'm going to show you is a quick video from the launch of Genesis 1, which took place on July 12, 2006. And this was a video at our North Las Vegas headquarters. Four, three, two, liftoff. We have liftoff of the Nepro launch vehicle carrying Genesis 1. The Russian launch went very well. They placed us within 400 meters of where they were predicting us to be, which is outstanding. Nobody could ask for anything better. Aerospace history was made by a local company this morning when an experimental spacecraft blasted into orbit atop a Russian rocket. We've got some great news. It is healthy, it is alive, so. Because we were on an active Russian nuclear missile base, they did not want us bringing a bunch of cameras or videos over. So the Russians gave us a recording of a previous launch from Baikonur, and that's what you just saw and what we played for the media. I love that idea because I'd seen that launch and I knew it would go very, very well, and the media would probably be too stupid to check to see if anything got to orbit anyway. Uh, what you have in your upper right-hand corner are actual stills from the launch of Genesis 1. As you can see, there's a lot less around an actual Russian nuclear missile silo than there is at Baikonur. As you heard on the video, the launch went extraordinarily well. They got us to within 400 meters of a desired orbital injection point, but it's a nuclear missile, so it's got to be accurate. And we even made the cover of Aviation Week afterwards. Uh, this is one of the first videos we got down from Genesis 1. If you want to picture the spacecraft, it's roughly 10 feet length, six feet in diameter, fully deployed. When we get these images, there are suites of cameras on the tips of the solar arrays. These are the forward arrays pointing downwards. That's Namibia going by in the background. And of course, the real purpose of Genesis 1 was to test and prove that the envelope would be the leak rate, be, et cetera. And the leak rate was literally in the noise throughout the entire mission that we're only guessing as to how long these things can stay fully rigidized and deployed, but let's just say you'll be dying of natural causes before you have to worry about the leak rate on Bigelow systems. They're extraordinarily robust. Um, due to the success uh, of Genesis 1, we were able to push forward even further with Genesis 2. We increased the uh, inflation diameter from roughly six feet to eight. 
tripled the amount of sensors and videos and cameras for everything on the system, and even developed some subsystems on Genesis 2 that we did not have on Genesis 1 because Genesis 1 was again focused on the superstructure. Uh, because of that, the system gained weight. Genesis 1 clocked in at about 2,600 pounds. Genesis 2 was closer to 3,000. Uh, due to the fantastic job that the Russians had done, we hired them again to launch Genesis 2. And frankly, one of the greatest victories of that program was that we were on the pad ready for launch by June 28, 2007, less than a year after the launch of Genesis 1, which, you know, in aerospace terms is very difficult to do. Uh, unlike our own export control policies, the Russians believe in a sensible strategy. And as they got to know us, all of a sudden the security requirements got thrown out the window and we traveled with the CNBC television crew who did a whole piece on the launch of Genesis 2, an excerpt of which I'm going to show you now. To pursue his dream, Bigelow had to travel to the most unlikely place, thousands of miles from his Las Vegas home. It's an area never photographed or visited by Western media until now. This is Russia's Yazny military base, located near the Kazakhstan border. Yazny was ground zero during the Cold War, a Soviet missile facility designed to bring mass destruction to the U.S. Well, I can remember uh, when all these missiles, uh, you know, were, were feared. In the 1950s, uh, we didn't know from moment to moment sometimes because of the uh, the rhetoric that was going on from Washington and Moscow as to, it was during the time when everybody had bunkers, you know, they had, they had the bomb shelters. Yazny is still a military base, but it's now home to the Russian aerospace company Kosmotros, old enemies now partnering up. But here we are at a military base and they're actually hosting us and launching our spacecraft. Bigelow has come here to conduct a critically important test launch intended to prove his prototype, Genesis 2, can actually work. He eventually hopes to deploy several inflatable structures like this, 50 feet long, 22 feet in diameter, big enough for a team of 10 people to spend days or even months floating in zero gravity. These vessels um, are probably the wave of the future. So as opposed to the fake videos, for the launch of Genesis 2, we had the CNBC folks on top of our hotel, the Ritz-Carlton of Siberia, uh, and they had their cameras pointed down to the field, and this is an actual recording of the launch of Genesis 2, which took place on June 28, 2007. There it goes. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. There it goes. There it goes. It's going to be just about reaching the speed of sound now. There it goes. Go, baby, go. We like to say at Big Lake Aerospace, reducing the world's nuclear arsenal, one rocket at a time. So. Two down, couple to go. And this is one of the first high-res images we got down from Genesis 2. And let me say, if Bigelow Aerospace's only purpose was to develop lunar habitats, we would still be doing exactly what we've done up to this day in terms of developing the technology, testing and validating in LEO on the way to the moon. So this technology, while we've got concepts for LEO operations, is extraordinarily applicable and useful for lunar development. As a matter of fact, the very idea of expandable habitats was initially developed to take astronauts to Mars. So we're eager to bring this technology full circle. One quick launch anecdote, we got back uh, from the successful launch of Genesis 2 from Moscow late on a Thursday. Friday morning, my wife was thrown up, took her to the doctor, found out she was pregnant. Nine months later, we have this little guy. Uh, proud father, I'm sending out the picture, he's not even 12 hours old here to all my friends. And later the Russians send me back this photo. Uh, it's Photoshop, but they did such a good job of fooling everyone. My father-in-law came bursting into the hospital room and said, how can you put my grandson in a metal collar? He's gonna break his neck. And all my friends at Johnson Space Center were like, why do the Russians even have baby space suits? <laughs> animals are we dealing with at Roscosmos where they had an infant program and 
you know, don't publicize this because I've done nothing to dissuade NASA that that wasn't the case. So. Uh, our next launch will be the BEAM, the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, which normally will be traveling to the International Space Station on CRS-8, uh, which is a Falcon 9, uh, in the summer of 2015. So uh, we're busy preparing for this launch. Everything is on schedule. And this will be the first time that an astronaut will step inside an expandable habitat. Uh, that will be a big moment for the program, a big moment for the technology, and we're particularly excited about what this says in terms of NASA endorsing the company and working with Bigelow Aerospace and endorsing the technology in terms of integrating it into what is the crown jewel of not just the American human space flight program, but the global human space flight program with the International Space Station. Uh, the way this will work is the beam will be inside the trunk of the Dragon spacecraft. The Canadian arm will remove the beam from the trunk and take it over to the aft port of node 3, uh, where it will be connected and pressurized. I was under the impression that it would take several hours uh, for the beam to actually go through the inflation theory, if not more. But according to the NASA animators, you just screw it in and jiffy pop, boom, it's done. So, <laughs> certainly hope it goes that smoothly in real life. Uh, the beam is the stepping stone to the BA-330, which is our full-scale habitable module, sort of our Model T, which has really been in development going back to 2007 and even further. As the name indicates, uh, these modules will provide roughly 330 cubic meters of internal volume. Each can operate as an independent space station, although as you see in this artist conception, they can be ganged together, and each module can support a crew of up to six. Again, we've had versions of this technology under testing for over a decade. The beam will be a nice step forward, and we're looking forward to beginning crewed operations with BA-330, hopefully in the not too distant future. Now, while that artist conception had LEO, again, we are very excited about the applicability of the technology to beyond LEO exploration, specifically the moon. And this technology offers a variety of advantages that are critical uh, for lunar exploration, development, and settlement. First off, of course, the obvious one, volume. This is almost a tent-like technology where again it's compacted in a rocket bearing, expands out in orbit, and you're good to go. Radiation, and this should not be underestimated. This is really why NASA is so fascinated with the technology. But when you hit a metallic structure with solar flares, you get a nasty secondary radiation effect or scattering effect. Whereas with expandable systems, because they're essentially non-metallic, you substantially reduce that effect. Physical debris. A lot of people, when they picture an inflatable or an expandable system, they say, oh, don't take out the scissors or a pin, it's going to pop. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, the way I like to tell people is, if you were being shot, would you rather have aluminum in front of you or a Kevlar vest? I vote the Kevlar vest. And we've actually done side-by-side type -side of velocity impact testing. Where we'll take some of the International Space Station, like the meteorite orbital debris layer, some of ours, goes right through the ISS stuff and stops on ours. So we are actually superior to a traditional metallic system when it comes to physical debris. Uh, you get a mass savings, and I mentioned the money savings previously. And these are actually models uh, that we developed and that you can still see at our facility. I think we went some to the American Museum of Natural History as well that shows utilizing these habitats for surface applications. Uh, there you see bags of regolith covering one of the habitats for concepts similar to what we've already heard about today. However, if you are going to make a significant uh, investment like this, it's not only radiation, but lawyers that you have to worry about. And again, Mr. Bigelow is very focused on the future uh, of lunar development, but that has to be protected in a legal and a policy sense. And the challenge that we face at Bigel Aerospace is how do you even begin this conversation when you have a international treaty that prohibits national appropriation uh, and you have a domestic regime that does not have an agency with authority to grant extraterrestrial property rights. And the hook that we decided to pursue, because we'd gone through it once with the Genesis 1 system, is a FAA payload review request. 
while there is no domestic entity that controls property rights beyond the Earth orbit, for you to launch anything commercial, a domestic entity must receive a launch license and or payload review from the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation. We have gone through it once ourselves. So that provides the perfect vehicle to have this discussion, to engage, and to move the ball forward. And at the end of the year, we filed our request to launch and place a Bigelow habitat on the moon. And to be clear, there are a wide variety uh, of policies and laws that say that the government should encourage private sector investment in commercial space systems, should create a clear legal system for commercial entities to operate in, and obviously responding positively to Bigel Aerospace's payload review request would be in keeping with all of those laws and policies. Um, another misunderstood uh, example of, back one, of what we're dealing with is a lot of people say, well, you can't do any of this because of the Outer Space Treaty. We would argue that what we're asking for, and let me be clear about what we're asking for here. Um, Big Low Aerospace and our payload review uh, really wants two things, and I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, one, approval to launch the habitat to the moon, uh, and second, that when we deploy, that at a minimum, we can enjoy non-interference, that there will be a zone of operation, that Big Low Aerospace will be able to conduct activities without fear of interference from other domestic entities licensed by the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation. At a minimum, if you're an entrepreneur investing in these sort of systems, that would seem to be the least that the government can grant you. And the FAA essentially already does this. An example would be that there are laws that would prevent a launch license from being granted for anyone who would come within 200 kilometers of a manned or a manable object, specifically the International Space Station. All that we're requesting is that the FAAST continues to abide by its obligation to maintain safety and security uh, in LEO orbit or wherever uh, to protect in America and make sure that there aren't problems. And, and again, in regard to problems, and this gets into the treaty, we're not planting a flag and saying, oh, we claim this territory uh, in the name of you know, Big Lair of Space or even America. All that we're asking for at this point is for a regulatory regime where the FAA will not issue launch licenses that could cause harmful interference, where you'd have different domestic entities on top of each other or interfering with each other. That in no way is national appropriation, does not violate the Outer Space Treaty, and if people have specific questions about the Outer Space Treaty, I can go through the specific aspects. But doing so is actually in keeping with the Outer Space Treaty, which demands non-interference, which demands supervision of a country's private sector entities, that they be safe and in conformance with the treaty. So what we're doing is actually in keeping with the treaty, and we would argue a positive response to our payload review request uh, would not only be in keeping with the treaty, but to do otherwise would be to abdicate the United States' obligations under the, under, under the Outer Space Treaty. So for both domestic law, for international law, uh, the answer should be yes. And this will at least create some momentum to provide assurance to entrepreneurs that are willing to spend a substantial amount of money that it takes to develop these systems. And hopefully we can return to the moon. So happy to take any questions. And that is, given the current state of technology and our understanding of uh, the physical aspects of the lunar surface in particular, how long would it take to do the kinds of structures that Hyam suggests is possible or even the Bigelow structure? Uh, setting aside how long it would take us to get the rocket there, once you or to find a rocket to send it on, but assuming that we have that, how long would it take to get a fully functioning uh, apparatus or structure on the moon? So, that's the hot button. That's for the video. Oh, okay. So I guess it depends uh, when we actually do this. Uh, 
we talked about the, the fact of using local resources and 3D printing technologies. Uh, they're not at the point where we can actually do it, although there, there are some companies that have actually developed 3D printing for the lunar surface, and they're, they're basically developing these technologies. So once we're there, it, it may be possible, and again, we're assuming that some of the knowledge base is there as far as where we're landing and what we would find there as far as materials. It could take a few months to really build something for a few people to come in and actually finish off. Uh, but again, it all depends when we're going to be doing this and what technology is available at that time. But it most likely would be 3D printing, ISRU kind of approach. As you saw in the presentation, we're already developing the technology. It's relatively mature and will actually go through a crew demonstration aboard the ISS by next year. If the public and private sector were to focus on it, and again, the government has an important role to play here, uh, we could implement a permanent presence on the moon within a decade. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think first there are some additional things we need to know. I mentioned that we had discovered that the poles are interesting and they have water deposits that are useful, but we don't know a lot about them. We don't know what their physical state is. We don't know how they vary laterally and vertically. In other words, you need to prospect for potential sites, uh, places to go that have the maximum utility, uh, the highest concentration of usable materials and the shortest possible traverse distance close to sources of, uh, of, of uh, permanent sunlight for energy. So given all that, I'm in, I'm in complete agreement that a decade is a reasonable time scale to establish a permanent presence on the moon. So in my opening remarks, I mentioned that we did a study for NASA focusing on standards. So on the issue of standards, particularly since um, uh, for focusing on a permanent uh, um, presence on the moon, we're clearly going to have you know, international partners involved, as well as, God willing, a lot of commercial companies. Uh, can anybody on the panel talk to the importance of standards in terms of what we develop on the moon? Uh, well, I'll take a stab at that. I mean. I think there are some areas on the moon that are more valuable than others. And so there is actually going to be a competition for resources. Um, the places I just mentioned that I outlined in my previous comment uh, are not global. They're not extensive. They, they are limited in extent. There are a limited number of them. I think that uh, the first entity, whether that's governmental or international or corporate, to get there and, and establish a presence is going to be ahead of the game. The longer we wait to make a decision to take advantage of it, the more difficult it's going to be for us to claim that we have a right to it. Yeah. If I can echo uh, the professor's comments, it is not unlimited real estate on the moon, at least in terms of the areas that are valuable. And one of the reasons that we're pursuing our FAA payload request is what you don't want is to have someone develop a permanent presence on the moon and enter into a Wild West scenario. That is a recipe for conflict. Uh, it's a recipe for confusion. And when it comes to standards, we need rules of the road. We need to know where public or private sector entities are operating. We need a basis for what those boundaries are, because if you don't have that, you're going to get in trouble, not only domestically, but potentially internationally. And that's a situation that would be best avoided. And frankly, we're already behind the eight ball in having that conversation. Sir. So it's a, it's a question to all three of you. Does the United States, as the United States, have an interest in U.S. private industry gaining a foothold, foothold on the moon and being first to having that foothold? And if so, why? And what would be the necessary changes to national space policy to enable that? Well, I'll, get, I'll take a stab at that. I, I, think, I think we have an national, important national interest in, in going back to the moon and in being present in cislunar space. And my argument would be that effectively, if we are not there, it is not clear to me that a free market 
democratic paradigms of societal organization will prevail in the frontier. In other words, the people that go there first and establish a presence and start doing things with the moon, and this applies not just to the moon, it applies to asteroids, to, to Earth orbit, it applies to all of space. Uh, the rules of the road are written by the people that are there. And if we're not there, it's not gonna be us writing the rules. And some people don't have the same dedication to democratic pluralism and free markets that we do. So I think that is the interest in the United States to be present on the frontier. The moon represents the ultimate high ground, and we ignore it at our peril. Uh, China is many things. Stupid is not one of them. You see their focus on the moon, and I think if you speak to the international community, they have been very disappointed uh, with existing U.S. policy and would like to see a shift to return to a focus to the moon and to see America lead again. And you, know, you heard from the panelists some of the potential applications relative to helium-3 or power generation, rare earth elements. Uh, the moon is a gateway to other destinations in the solar system. I don't think we can risk not being there. If we do, as the professor said, we risk everything America stands for. Yeah, I guess I would just, uh, I compare it with everything that was said. I would add uh, just a historical perspective. If we think back to the settlement of the West in this country, uh, you know, there wasn't much there and, you know, there were all kinds of debates. You know, is it worth, uh, is it worth uh, buying uh, the Louisiana Purchase? Is it worth uh, expanding and sending people there? And, and uh, the, uh, the upside economics of it, the, the huge um, uh, creation of new technologies uh, would really go to the people who actually try to try to do that to go there. Thank you. I'm Frank Warren with Aviation Week. Um, right now, we're we are going in a particular direction toward the moon, cis lunar space, the deep retrograde orbit, uh, with the um, space launch system, heavy lift rocket, and. Um, um, the Orion capsule. Is this the right way to be going if we wanted to, say, start tomorrow to get there in a, in a, in a decade? For example, Mike, what, what would you need to get to the moon, to get down to the moon? Um, what else do we need? So clearly we need a lander. Um, what are we doing that we, that we need to do? And are we doing, is what we're doing in the right direction? And I could talk well past lunch on that issue, but uh, uh, to be succinct, heavy lift capability is critical to any Beyond Leo operation, the moon in particular. So that is a technology and a capability that we think is very important. Uh, to address the SLS system directly, I would argue that expandable habitat technology really has the ability to unleash the potential of a heavy lift system like that. We could, if you've seen the Olympus module or the BA-2100 that we're developing, you could put up in a single launch massive structures. So certainly, at least I feel that heavy lift uh, is very important. You need capsules to go back and forth and landers, as you point out. Uh, unfortunately, funding is scarce and Bigelow Aerospace discussed this in our results of our Space Act agreement. Mr. Bigelow gave a briefing last year that leveraging a commercial model, uh, particularly going back to the way COTS was executed, uh, represents a strategy that could gain bipartisan support to create not only a viable and practical return to the moon, but an affordable one which is absolutely necessary to enact the vision in today's fiscally constrained environment. Um, the existing program will provide us a capability to carry out some operations in lunar vicinity, but you're right, we can't, we don't have a program now to build a lander. I've, I've sort of looked at this issue in a, in a different way. I've, I've approached it saying, if my goal is to be on the moon and, and to be able to use resources and produce them, how will I get there? How will I get there from where I am now? And the answer I came up with, uh, I wrote a paper a couple years ago with a guy named Tony Lavoie from NASA Marshall, 
And we decided the way to do this was to emplace robotic assets on the moon and begin processing lunar ice in, into water and storing it on the lunar surface. Ultimately, these robots, which are controlled from Earth, would build the lunar outpost. And then when we're ready to send people, they would effectively go there and move into a turnkey operation. The advantage of approaching of an architecture that's built that way, where you effectively go robotically first and people come later, gives you a lot of flexibility. It, it reduces the total mass requirements you need to launch. It takes the maximum advantage of the leverage you get from local resource production, and it makes you into a, a productive processing mode where you're actually making more water than you need to get there, water being propellant, uh, so it's available for export. So you can actually start making a profit much sooner. So what we're, the SLS is a fine heavy lift. It'll do 70 metric tons of LEO. That's plenty for just about anything uh, I can imagine. Uh, Orion is basically a, a, a cis lunar vehicle, right? It's not really, you can't go to Mars on its own. It would need some kind of habitation module. So effectively it's designed to get astronauts from Earth and to re-enter at escape velocity. So that, that's, that's its, its part in the, in the in mosaic. So it's both the things we're doing now are necessary but not sufficient. That's how I'd put it. And Frank, let me say too that, in my opinion, this is less about the technology than it is about the policy. And one of the greatest threats to moving forward is frankly cost plus contracting. Whatever system we're developing, to the extent we implement a system that leverages fixed price, milestone basis procurement, uh, in a sense that does not sacrifice safety, the beam for example is being done under the FAR, then we can afford to do a lot of these things. Uh, obviously SLS and Orion you know, take up a great deal of funding that we need to look at some innovative procurement solutions to move forward, otherwise all of this remains science fiction. I want to follow up on the technical question though, because but I think the precursor robotics is a fundamental step that both I am and, and Dr. Spudis mentioned. To what extent do we have that that technology? Are, is our robotics state of the art sufficiently advanced to do the kinds of things that you would envision needing to be done, or is there additional work that has to be done there? And if so, is anyone doing that kind of work? Yeah, I, I, I think it is. I, I think we have pretty much the capabilities we need right now to begin the activities I've described. Now obviously you could probably, we have a learning curve. If you go to the moon and you start doing productive work, you're going to have to learn how to maintain equipment for long periods of time, the dust is very abrasive, moving parts will stop. Those things are all solvable problems. In fact, in a lot of cases we know what the mitigating strategies are. For example, the dust, which is very angular and abrasive because it's broken up by the meteorite impacts, turns out that it's magnetic of all things. The reason is because there's a vapor phase deposition of, of native metal iron on the outside of the glass surfaces. So by the simple expedient of a brush with magnetic bristles, you can get rid of nine-tenths of the dust just that way. So little things like that, that you wouldn't really think of offhand, already exist, they're already known. I think we can get a lot done uh, with what we have now. Uh, the more technology we have, the better, but I think that will come in time naturally. Yeah, I would agree that some of the technology is there already. One of the big issues certainly is reliability, and there is a lot of research going on on uh, space systems that can uh, self-repair, uh, self-healing systems. Uh, so, uh, and I would agree with Paul that really a, a lot of this would evolve much faster if we start trying some of these things on the moon and just do it on site to really see what's happening with our technology. Joe Rauscher, is there anything else on your wish list that could be done at the ISS in addition to the uh, module if you had uh, more access? Yeah, I, I think a key technology that we need to learn, if, if, if this vision I've sort of sketched out of using the moon as a refueling logistics depot is correct, we need to practice handling those things in, in microgravity. So what I would do at ISS, I'd launch a ton of water and I'd practice cracking it in the oxygen and hydrogen and freezing those gases into cryogens, transferring the cryogens to small demo spacecraft uh, and, and doing maneuvers in orbit. So in order to work sort of an end-to-end -end systems demo 
that basically assumes, all right, now we're bringing the water up from the Earth, in the future we'll be bringing it from the Moon. So that's something we could do right now on ISS that's directly relevant to lunar uh, development. In regards to the, the structure of the permanent habitat, uh, how significant is the threat posed by asteroids and other space debris that may collide with the moon? Uh, well, um, the very small asteroids are not, not a serious threat if you have something on the order of three meters of regolith on top. Uh, certainly the, uh, a very big size asteroid, you can't shield against it all, but the majority of the, of the micrometeorites would not really be a threat, but they would be a threat certainly for uh, surface operations where there are no sh there are no shielding uh, structures. It, there's there's no human space debris in the lunar vicinity. That's all in LEO and in, and in the high orbits around Earth. Uh, and the and the flux of natural meteoroids is is very low. Yet you get big impacts, but they're very rare and they don't occur everywhere. Alright, I have two more hands, so we'll take those right there in the red. Hi, I'm uh, Chuck Devine. Uh, I'll give an organization of Metro Washington Mensa. Uh, I might write this up for our newsletter. A couple questions. After the Columbia accident, there was, shall we say, a major investigation of NASA that showed some very interesting cultural problems within NASA. As someone who's got a foot in both the tech and the arts worlds, uh, a lot of people are now saying that the STEM problem is really a STEAM problem. In other words, we can do a lot better than we are currently doing across science and technology fields than what we are currently doing. Oh, the A stands for the arts. And one of the things that I've noticed recently or over the last few years, 18% of our economy is currently going into medical care. Some of us are calling it medical theater because half of that money doesn't get anybody any good. I could see shifting money from medicine to your projects very easily. Uh, any reaction to what I've just said? Well, I've spent, oh, sorry, thank you. Well, I've spent a great deal of time talking about Beyond Leo and, and lunar development. One of the primary focuses of our LEO development is exactly that on biotech, pharmaceuticals, next generation, drug treatments. There is a whole new arena in microgravity for advances in that field, as well as others with material science. The key is to create a laboratory that more properly simulates what you would have here terrestrially. Uh, the problem that we've been suffering from in the ISS, which just finished construction, is if you had a lab here on Earth that you could only access once every five years for a few hours, you're not going to get a lot of good science done in that fashion. So now we're entering a very interesting phase with International Space Station and hopefully the Bigelow uh, material where we can focus more on utilization. And one of the big differences between the Bigelow Station and the ISS is not just technology, but the sovereign clients or astronauts that come to our station internationally will exclusively spend their time on their own activities, their own research, be it public or private. And we think that's a revolutionary change because astronauts right now spend a great deal of time on operations and maintenance that hopefully will result in a lot of the advances, particularly in biotech and pharma, that could really help fund our push towards the stars. Since you mentioned STEM and STEAM, um, I just make a point from the educational point of view that um, more people, more students who come into it, to Rutgers as freshmen it came to engineering because of interest in space than any other area that I've seen. And so it's kind of sad that there's not really something that they can see as an overarching national effort. Uh, and, so, and also to address the other issue, you know, what, what, what I would hope for, I would hope that we stop talking about asteroid retrieval because asteroid retrieval is a great thing, but it's sort of a second or third thing that we would do after going to the moon and, and, and building settlements there. There are a lot of issues related to asteroid retrieval and, and now it's really something that is hot because the, the administration has put it forward as, as a goal for NASA. It, it should not be our first goal. 
by any means in my view. So, you know, I'm, I'm hearing that I've got private companies that are manufacturing space modules that are manufacturing the capsules that are manufacturing heavy lift reusable lift. Um, and realistically, the space launch system is never going to be available to a company like you. It'll be launching far too few times at far higher cost. So in your view, what is the relevance of NASA and the public investment to this at all? What, what role does NASA have at all? Since they do not seem to be focused on a propellant depot that would be enabling to this architecture, they do not seem to be focused on space development at all. NASA and the government still have a critical role to play because the commercial space industry in many ways is still in its infancy. Uh, a good example of that is, again, our beam project. NASA is purchasing that module. It will be launched on a SpaceX vehicle developed via you know, the COTS and the CRS program, and that represents the synergy that you need the government to play to kickstart or act as a catalyst for all these things. Uh, real quick, to go back to the SpaceX example, I don't think, and I don't mean to speak for SpaceX, but I don't believe that they were beating down customers to get onto the Falcon 9 prior to the government being the ones to first contract with SpaceX for the Falcon 9. Once they had that government endorsement, it was the gold star that led them to have a manifest that is so full people question whether they can even meet it. So the government as an anchor tenant, be it with an operation like us with the BA330, we would very much like to see the government, NASA in particular, as an anchor tenant for our system, can act as a catalyst to getting to the next step. Uh, because certainly the international community feels much more confident with NASA at the beginning, and then a system can move forward, and again, SpaceX being an example, where they could exist purely on commercial telecom launches now, but would not have gotten to that point if not for the government kickstart. So the government role continues to be very important. And then even once our systems mature, then the government role becomes important in moving out further to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I would say that NASA really uh, uh, has the role of uh, what the, the building of the railroads was going back to the West. So West, the West developed and government created the infrastructure that companies could then capitalize on. Uh, also, as far as space, uh, a lot of uh, uh, lay people forget that, uh, with all due respect to all the great companies that are now becoming space companies, uh, that a lot of the technology really evolved from, from NASA-developed technologies. And so the, the resources that have been created in NASA and all the NASA centers, all the very smart people there that can do a lot of research that can't be done anywhere else should be uh, should form the basis of uh, a partnership between the government and industry to do what needs to be done to to develop space, go back to the moon, and do all the things that have been talked about here this morning. All right, well, thank you all for joining us for this great conversation. Please join me in thanking the panel.